Awesome, thank you. All right, let's call the Community Health and Safety Task Force meeting for January 10th, 2023 to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Um, I don't know, Julie or Valeria, whoever's yeah. doing it. Happy to, to step in. Um, roll call, uh, co-chairs, um, Rene Villarreal. Present. Chris Rivera. Here. Annie Raskin. Here. Emily Kaltenbach. Present. Marcela Diaz. I'm here. Gino Zamora. Here. Mary Louise Romero. Here. Monica Alt. Here. Bruce Finger. You're on mute, my friend. There you are. Here, here, here. Okay. And um, welcoming our uh, the Santa Fe Fire Department uh, team members and also our community member, Sarah. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Please uh, let me know if I missed anybody. Uh, we've got Mike Wagner and David Brocious and Brian Moya and uh, Stephen Johnson. Thank you all for making um, the time for us this evening. And, and being with us and sharing your um, your expertise. So I'll pause there. Um, back to you, Chris, or would you like me to continue through the agenda? Oh, thank you, uh, Valeria. Uh, we're on to <laughs> approval of the minutes from December 6th. Any uh, changes that anybody noticed? All right, what are the wishes of the committee? <clears throat> So we need a motion for approval in the minutes. I move to approve. I'll second. A motion for approval in the second of the minutes. Um, any further discussion? All right, can we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Valeria, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, Co-chairs, uh, Rene Villarreal. Yes. Chris Rivera. Yes. Annie Raskin. Yes, yeah, sorry about yes. that. No worries. Emily Kaltenbach. Yes. Marcela Diaz. Yes. Gino Zamora. Yes. Bruce Finger. Yes. Monica Alt. Yes. Mary Louise Romero. Yes. Thank you. Completed our roll call. Thank you. Uh, communication from co-chairs. Uh, Renee, I'll let you go first. Mm. I'm wondering if our communications, we should wait till after the presentation and then just move everything down. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. Um, is that okay with everybody? Just to mm -hmm. flip it around so we, since we have our guests. So I'll just make a motion to change our agenda so that we have the presentation first and then the communications from the chairs and also the facilitator, as well as the task force members and any updates before we go into um, our breakouts. Yeah, I do want to uh, take a second to just uh, apologize to community members who thought the meeting was at five o'clock. Uh, it was noticed that way. Um, typically, we never meet at five o'clock, so I don't know what happened there. Uh, we usually meet at 530. So um you know i apologize for for any issues that or any problems that may have uh, um brought up so you know we're we're meeting now 30 minutes later so um hope that's okay if you need to call myself or renee to talk about that that's um probably fine so uh, just wanted to mention that All right, let's go directly to presentations, mental health first responders. Uh, Chief Johnson, you're listed as this. I assume you're you're gonna take the lead on this and then probably pass it on. So it's uh, on to you. Thank you, uh, Chairman, Madam Chair, and members of the committee, good evening. 
Uh, it's my honor to uh, <clears throat> introduce this presentation given by Captain Mike Wagner and Captain David Brocious in the fire department. Um, it is a, a presentation about uh, PTSD within uh, the fire department and first responders. They have a, a short clip, a short um, trailer that we try to start with, and, and uh, I'll try to share my screen on that. If you'll give me just a second. And while we're waiting, you um, it's good to see you guys again. We had this presentation at the Quality of Life Committee, and then you also presented at what other department or what other committee? Uh, public safety. Public safety. Okay. Great. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Do you have um, rights to the screen Do I sharing? I have rights to share. Maybe the host. Julie says office. yes. No. If you need me to, I can pull it up. There you go. How's that? You got it. Okay. Here we go. Their volume. So there's no sound. No volume, is that what I'm hearing? Not yet. There's a way to put it through Zoom, but I, um, it's separate from like what you're hearing on the video from, on your own side, but I can't remember. Does anyone know what that, what you need to do to put the sound through? Hey, Steen, let me try, um, let me yeah, try yeah. mine. Okay, I emailed you the link if you need that. Just over 34 years, I've seen a lot of things. Can you hear it? A little low volume, but yes. Yes. We only investigate major fires. Fatalities are high dollar loss of parts. Now we have audio with no video. Every call days of the It's rewarding work, but it's not good work. This lives through that over and over again. That continued repetitive trauma. A lot of farmers are working. Mm -hmm. anything, I can wear a smile when I'm at work and do my job. But I also it's really that. hard to hear. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem. First responders mm -hmm. need clinical diagnosis for PTSD. That's astounding. It's coming on closed caption. If you guys want to turn on the closed caption. Mom, brother, sister. It's your volume of things that you see. They're going to have an effect. They're going to take a toll. I felt like there was some sort of a stigma attached to it. The fear of appearing weak. Got a front row seat to human tragedy. Self-care is not an option in this line of work. It has to be this way. Or outnumber 
I had the line of doing dust and stuff like that. But we really need to start opening people's eyes and what are we going to do about this? Sorry, all I hope you're able to hear that. Well, Julie, why don't we just move on to Captain Brocious and uh, Captain Wagner. Sure, go ahead, uh, Captain Brocious. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Brocious. I'm a captain here in Santa Fe Fire at Station 4 on B-Shift. Um, so this documentary called The Call We Carry is out of Tacoma, Washington. It's actually made by a paramedic in that department. Um, and just to give you a little background, they're a single tier system, just like we are. Um, so that means that we run the EMS and the fire. Um, they actually have a schedule that they have four shifts where we have three shifts in our department. I should have mentioned that um, in, in past in past meetings um so and in speaking with the the maker like this is a this is an issue that's happening countrywide and it doesn't matter what schedule uh people are working uh post-traumatic stress is is running rampant through the first responder ranks um give you a little background we gave uh myself and captain training captain wagner gave this presentation to the entire field um and our purpose in doing that was to break the stigma and, and show that our, our culture is changing in our fire department and we're going to be vulnerable. And um, so we showed this, the, the entire documentary, Mike Wagner and I shared our personal stories, which I'll share with you in a little bit. Um, and then we laid out all of the, the tools and resources that our department has at our disposal. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and share your story. And if you guys haven't seen the, the documentary, I strongly encourage you to watch it because there's a lot of parallels to what's going on at Tacoma that's leading to the same issues uh, in Santa Fe. Call volume rise, rise in, in, violent, uh, in violent crime, homeless population. Um, it's just no, no break at all. Like just like today. And it's not just calls that we're going through, which, uh, when I first got in 14 years ago, we were running about 8,000 calls. And last year we ran 20,800. Um, so that's a significant increase. And we've done it with only adding two apparatus in that 14 years. We've added medic two and medic six, no new stations and no new fire engines. And then on top of that, like this morning, you know, we still have to, we work 40 hour shifts. We had to go shop and cook for our guys. We had to go drive to the airport from station four, which is by St. Vincent's hospital uh, to do airport familiarization training. So there was a good hour and a half, hour, two hours out of our day. We ran calls constantly throughout the day. And then we just had to go switch out units just right now. So it's not just the, the, the calls that are, are leading to this, this mental health problem. It's everything that's involved in the job. And I, I haven't done a good job explaining that uh, in the past presentation, that it's not just the calls, it's, it's having to do all the other little things on top of the calls and not getting that mental break. Um, but to share my story with you on February 19th of, uh, or February 22nd of 2019, uh, I was a member of the heavy rescue at the time. And we got a call for a major motor, motor vehicle accident with entrapment at St. Francis and Hickox. Um, ended up being two fatalities on that call, a father and his son. Uh, the father's name was Dominic and me and a guy on my crew ended up working a code on a nine-year-old boy uh, named Jeremiah and that call was absolutely the the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Um, you know, I'd seen a lot of a lot of difficult calls in my career, but this one absolutely broke me. I I was crying at the hospital, hearing his mother scream, "Why, why, why?" Um, I went home that day. It's the only time I've gone home. I went to my wife's work actually, and I broke down crying. Um, um. And then fast forward, this, this led to a series of events 
Um, fast forward about a year and a half to May of 2020, uh, my wife and I had started a charity drive for a gentleman in our department that needed a life-saving surgery. Um, thankful to say that he's back on duty, but uh, in the middle of this charity drive, when I was doing what I thought I was was the best thing I've ever done in my life, I had a legitimate plan. I'd gotten so low because of the events of the from that day of that car accident till then that as soon as as soon as Marcos's charity drive was complete, I was going to take my own life. Um, I had a legitimate plan. Uh, I'd gotten all my financial documents in order for so that way my wife. She wouldn't have to do anything. Um, luckily, I made a last ditch effort and I'm still here. Um, and that's kind of the point is we want to I, I want to share my story and, and, and Captain Wagner has his own story. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we shared with our department to be vulnerable and let other guys be vulnerable in the same way and get the help that they need so that no one gets in the spot that we were in. And I'll go ahead and give the floor to Mike Wagner. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mike Wagner. I'm a training captain with the Santa Fe Fire Department. I've got about 13 years in the department, most of them as a paramedic, and now I'm in the training department at Station 5. I'm seeing this increasing problem with PTSD in our fire department, and something needs to be done about it. Uh, we are running running a, a high volume of calls right now, which is very overwhelming because we need a, a mental break after some of these calls. And it's hard to process some of the things that we see when we don't get that break. I was diagnosed with PTSD several years ago, and I too had contemplated suicide for uh, probably over a year. Um, didn't want to leave my family, didn't, didn't want to die, but I was in so much pain and I was in such a dark place that um, that definitely seemed like an option for me, uh, which is really hard to say and it's really scary, but um, we're here to do something about that, to try to prevent suicides in the future. Um, in 2021, there were 125 firefighters that took their own lives and that number is likely to be more like 300 due to the fact that firefighter suicides are underreported. Um, it's estimated that only about 40% of them are being reported. Um, that's due to volunteers not being included in the data. That's due to protecting firefighter dignity and their um, you know, life insurance benefits, stuff like that. Also, a lot of the retirees are not being included in those numbers. Um, you know, after they are separated from the department. Not only are we losing people to suicide, we're, we're also losing quality of life. We're losing members to alcoholism and depression, broken relationships, um, insomnia, loneliness, isolation. One thing we need to do to fix that is to change the culture in our fire department, which I'm proud to be part of turning the corner on that. What we're learning is that vulnerability is one thing that's getting in our way. It's not talking about it. And that's definitely what got me in that dark, down that really, really dark road because I wasn't able to talk about it, including with my own family. PTSD makes you feel like there's something wrong with you or that you did something to deserve the way you're feeling. And for me, I was not able to open up to my closest loved ones because I wanted to protect them from that that darkness inside me. And that's part of what makes PTSD get worse is because we bottle everything up inside and we don't talk about it. And I really hope we're getting to a, a part to a place where it's okay to talk about things. And I've seen that over the last couple of years become better. It's also scary at the same time because I'm seeing more people talk about the struggles they're going through. Um, about 30, 35% of firefighters will develop symptoms of PTSD. And we're also five times more likely to commit suicide than those of the general public. We are trying to bring awareness to our department 
but we can only do so much. We are giving trainings. Uh, we are developing a peer support group right now, um, which is kind of the first line of help for firefighters where they can call up somebody who's trained in the, in the peer support realm and have kind of like an informal counseling session and have somebody to talk to or to help find um, more serious um, resources. Um, we also have a service from Peer Support Psychology Group, which is a psychology group out of Albuquerque that we have a contract with that we're able to seek specialized mental health resources. You know, they just they just treat first responders. And what's good about that is that they understand our job. They understand the things that we see. They understand the sacrifices of family life and how that plays into everything. So it's an it's a excellent resource that we have where we're able to go talk to somebody who already understands our job, who already knows what we're going through. And um, on top of that, we really need more resources. We, we really need more personnel to, to face this problem. Um, so I'm just here to say that this is a, this is a real problem. I'm seeing it with a lot of my good friends. There's a lot of people in our department suffering, um, at very high rates. And like Captain Brosha said, it's not solely due to the the graphic nature of the calls that we go on, because there are definitely many of those, but it's also a compilation of just the volume of calls that, that makes things hard to deal with. We do go on a lot of very troubling calls. For example, pediatric deaths, um, suicides are really hard calls to go on. Um, and not only the things that we see, but it's taking on some of the pain from the families and the bystanders. It's, again, like Captain Brocious said, it's hearing a mother scream for her dead child or trying to bargain. Um, all of these things, they stick with us. While we think where we're handling them at some period of time, it's only a matter of time before a straw breaks the camel's back. And that could be even a less significant call. And what happens is it brings up all the emotions from all the, the horrible calls we've been on. And, and that's about it for me. Um, I, I really, really appreciate you all having us here and hearing us out and for your time. And we'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you, uh, Captain. Um, Chief Moya, anything you want to add? Um, I'll just wait for questions. Uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, we'll just wait for questions and we'll go from there. Um, I think they've summed it up perfectly. I'll just wait and we'll uh, ask answer any questions people have. Great. Any questions from committee members? Just before we go to questions, I just wanted to again thank our captains uh, Wagner and Brocious um, to be able to share their stories. Um, and maybe it gets easier each time, I'm not sure, um, but, I, but I sure appreciate that you're able to um, give us um, your personal experiences, your lived experiences um, to show what that's like. And, you know, Chris might not share with us, but, you know, at times, things that have happened in the past stick with you, even locations of where things have occurred, you you recall that traumatic experience. So I just wanted to thank you all for, for sharing that experience. And um, the one thing I did say in the last meeting is that taking care and taking care of your mental health and well-being, and also creates empathy so that you're able to empathize for situations that you're in um, that are stressful. Um, and it also, ultimately helps you do your job better because that empathy will then help you um, better serve the community that's experiencing the same kind of trauma and crisis situation. So I think those are, to me, that goes hand in hand, the importance of your health and well-being and how 
it's it supports our community's health and well-being. And then the other thing is, I think the reflection of the pain and um, trauma that you experience is also a reflection of the pain and trauma that our communities are experiencing. So when you're seeing those calls tick up, it's also looking at kind of like the big picture of like what's happening in our communities that we need to shift, um, that we need to do better um, so that obviously that affects the number of calls. So it goes hand in hand about the ways that we need to look at structural changes in our community. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let, let's see, do you know, I think you have your hand up, a question? Uh, this is Bruce Finger. Here we are. Uh, um, Chief and um, captains, thank you for again sharing your story and helping us as a task force um, understand and humanize the the experiences that that you and the members of the fire department um, you know, what, what, what you go through. Uh, I think it's an incredible step that you're taking to vocalize um, and share your stories uh, with, within the department. I think my question will go to what, what resources um, do members of the department have when they are ex experiencing PTSD? And that's, that's namely, are there counselors available either in-house or, um, or, or contracted? Uh, and, and, and what other resources? In addition to sharing the experiences, then what help do, do, does someone receive within the department after that? I can address that. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, and members of the students. Um, yes, we have a combination of different resources available to the firefighters and EMTs in our department. Yeah, Chris, Chris is on the other meeting. Chris, can you um, mute yourself, please? Thank you. Uh, we, have a, we have a group within the fire department called our peer support group. Uh, these are, these are uh, folks that have been uh, taking special training gone to class taking special training on just how to recognize people that are that are under enormous emotional stress um and uh then learning how to uh connect with them or uh or visit with them and direct them um to further resources if if need be we also contract with the psychology group out of albuquerque that provides uh one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, counseling sessions for any any member of our uh, fire department. They also provide our critical incident stress debriefing um, services that uh, if we have a, a an unusually uh, significant call or disturbing call, uh, that team or that crew can reach out and uh, and this group PSPG will send a counselor uh, up to Albuquerque um, within the same day. And uh, so many times within just a few hours, and so that we can gather that group and have a debriefing, kind of a group debriefing. Um, so those those are examples of uh, of what we're offering our firefighters currently. We're always open to other suggestions. Okay, thank you, Chief, for describing that. I would I would like to add a, re a resource I was able to utilize. Um, this is Captain Wagner. Um, when I got to the lowest of lows and, you know, I was looking at suicide as, as an option, um, I was able to, to get treatment at an inpatient treatment facility in Draper, Utah, where I spent 37 days. Um, and I was able to learn a lot and learn a lot of what it takes to, to come out the other side of PTSD, the, the, the resiliency. And so I'm very fortunate to have been able to do that, but that would be a more high level resource that we have um, for our firefighters. <clears throat> uh, the National Firefighters Union has a, 
a center, they call it the Center for Excellence. And that's a, that's a firefighter specific PTSD treatment. That's also inpatient. That's, a, that's about 30 to 40 days, depending on uh, the patients there. So um, in some more extreme circumstances, we have that, but it's, we really want to, to get our members better because if we're not okay, we're not able to provide our services to the best of our ability to the citizens. So that's, that's why I think this is, this is really important. And I think that all of us working together can help find solutions to make this a better environment for not only the first responders, but the, the community in general. Thank you, Captain Wagner. Any other uh, questions, comments? I, Mary Louise has her hand up. Mary Louise. First, I just, I want to celebrate your bravery, each and every one of you for stepping out of your comfort zone and your willingness <sighs> to school us, to teach us, and to humble us, um, and to celebrate what you do every day. I want to start by saying that my question is, is the city doing anything to respond to these needs? And if so, it sounds like there's some resources. What is missing? What is, what is it that we need to know and how we can deliver that message to those that can figure out what the needs are, right? And, and, I, and I want to know what that is, because when we talk about the things that are getting in the way of us being at our best, we also need to figure out what is the need. And so my question is, is that, if any of you or all of you can respond to that. Chief Moya, that may be one for you to start with. Uh, Madam uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee, yeah, uh, Mary Louise, I think I think we're starting with a cultural shift. I think that's where we are. When I came in, it was you bottle it up, you go on the next call, and you move forward. Um, by bringing Captain Brocious and Captain Wagner up with these conversations, changing the shift, changing how we present things. Um, we've also had different ways of when we had these major calls, we bring this PSPG in, they do debriefings. At the beginning, nobody wanted to speak. So I think it's the beginning of a change of culture within the fire department, within the police department, where it's okay to talk. It's okay to say, I need a break. I need time to, you know, absorb this information, absorb what just happened, um, take the ambulance, like uh, paramedic Wagner used to be, and now he's a captain, take them out of service and let them have that time to, you know, take that break. We're still developing. Um, we're still trying to get it. This peer support team, we're adding more members. Uh, I think uh, Captain Wagner's in the class this week. So he's in Albuquerque this week taking that class. I think that's true. Um, so we, at, we're, we had five members and now we're going up to 10. So I think more of it is a cultural shift. Um, we have the resources to pay PSPG. We're gonna expand the contract. We have more people using that contract. I only ask, we only need to send them their names. Um, we don't need to send anything else. I think something that, that was brought to my attention by a retiree this week was we might need to, if you retire from the Santa Fe Fire Department, we offer this opportunity to you for so many years. I think that's something that a retiree brought to my attention. When we separate, there, all the resources have dropped. So I think that's something that we as a department or as a city need to say, you gave us 21 years or however many years you gave us, we should be able to support you to be able to go talk to a counselor, go have issues sleeping, um, a lot of people tell me it takes them six to eight months after they retire to understand, you know, it's that bell goes off and they're not there to, you know, they don't, they don't understand that they keep getting up at night. So I think we're moving in the right direction. It's a very slow process by Captain Brocious and Captain Wagner coming out of their shells and ex sharing these experiences. This is great. They did the training for the department. They shared this video. We have, we're just, it's, it's a train that needs to move in a small, different direction and we're starting to get there. I've had people come to my office more than them and, and give me their experiences and give me stuff that they don't want to share anywhere else, but with me. So I think it's just letting people know that it's comfortable to say, I need help. It's not right. I think that's where we need to go. 
Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being a leader with integrity and your willingness to be vulnerable with your team because that matters so much. And so thank you for that. And thanks everybody that came um, on, on this meeting today. I think that each and every one of us, when we get off of this um, Zoom call, this, this is such an opportunity for us to take a moment and send a prayer and just recognize and just celebrate that these people are doing really, really good and hard work. And so thank you guys again. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mary Louise, any, oh. anybody else questions, comments? Yes, Chris, we have Marcella with her hand up. Go ahead, okay. Marcella. Thank you. I'd like to echo, obviously, what everyone else has said and thanking you for coming forward and sharing this important information with us. And we are in a position to be able to make recommendations. We don't know if the council will take them um, in the course of this next uh, year. And so uh, kind of along the lines of what Mary Louise was asking, you know, what specifically you, you all need to help ameliorate the situation. Um, and so, you know, what we've heard or what I've heard is, is there needs to be more break time and that's a staffing issue between calls you need and, and it, it exacerbates the problem to have one right after the other. And, and so correct me if I'm wrong. And then the second, the second question I have just is about the mental health support and the services. And it sounds like you're gonna expand this program uh, with the psychology, the, what is it, the peer support um, group out of Albuquerque. And forgive me for not my ignorance, <laughs> captains and, and chiefs, that um, when you talk about the inpatient, because that sounds like it was really helpful, uh, when you talk about the inpatient treatment, who pays for that? Is it the union? Is it the city? Are these services? Because that, you know, a, a 27 day or a 37 day treatment in, in person treatment is seems like that would be really expensive. And so are those other services that the city should be kicking in for? Do they already pay for them? Can you explain to us a little bit just how that works and, and if that is also an additional need? And um, beyond just staffing and more mental health support services, if there's anything else that we could on your behalf recommend to the city as we put together our report. Um, I can take part of this question, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, when I went to the, my inpatient treatment, it was covered by insurance and it was approved by insurance. So I got approval to, to go to the program. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of weeks into the program, um, the doctor uh, called me into her office and said that the insurance company was trying to fight it that they were trying to recommend that I go to an outpatient program. And so while I was dealing with everything I was dealing with, I had the, the added stress of, wow, maybe this might not be covered. How much am I gonna get um, stuck with? Because my, my 35 day treatment was about $40,000. And so, so that was an additional stress. And I don't know how that ended up because um, Deer Hollow was a facility I went to. They told me that my, my well-being was number one and that they would fight the insurance company directly. And if they ended up losing in the end, they were going to eat the cost of my, uh, of my training so or my treatment. Um, I did have to pay about uh, $2,700 out of pocket, and that was just for uh, meals and, and, um, that kind of stuff, like the housing, um, and then my airfare out there and, and back. So it, it really wasn't too bad on my end be, after I got past the, the stress of worrying if I was even going to be able to continue with that treatment. Um, Captain Brocious can answer a little bit more into, uh, what our union is doing for that. We are, trying to develop a program where we will um, financially assist people when it comes to flying out there and, and um, doing the, you know, paying for the meals and that kind of stuff, as well as 
um, helping cover with, you know, sick leave or annual leave um, that they may need to be out there. Um, I went on FMLA personally, and I was away from the job for about 60 days total, because when I came back, I had some outpatient tr treatment to, to go through. And unfortunately, I went 192 hours into the negative. That was kind of back when I guess we were allowed to go in the negative on sick leave. So um, after I came out of all, all of that, um, I had to build up all that time back. And so I think we're, we're doing some, some things where we can um, start a fund where we can either donate uh, time or um, other financial resources to, to help people get through that. Because when somebody's going through this despair and, you know, have this relationship problems or they might have a marriage, you know, on the line or their job on the line or the lives, we as a union want to do whatever we can to, to help take some of that unnecessary uh, stress off of their plate. So um, Captain Brocious can really answer more to what the union is doing as far as that goes. Thank you. Yeah. So I am, I am currently the union health and safety chair. And in our, in our recent discussions, uh, one of the things I was trying to propose is that um, right now, like Captain, Captain Wagner talked about, he had to use his own sick leave and annual leave to go do this. But this is truly an on-the-job injury, um, and it's actually covered by presumptive dis um, post-traumatic stress is a presumptive disability in the state of New Mexico. Um, so we're trying to, I know that's a negotiated, um, negotiated thing between the union and, and management. Um, but that's one of my main pushes um, because on the union health and safety side, we've done a really good job of identifying physical hazards like cancer reduction, things like that. Uh, my big push now is the mental health side uh, because like Captain Wagner said, there's, a, there's a, a, a pretty decent chunk of our department that are utilizing the services of, of the PSPG and, and the peer support group. So it's a bigger issue that needs to be addressed. And like like Captain Wagner said, is when you're trying to get help for something that's happened from on the job, an on the job injury, um, it's a it's an invisible injury, but it's still an on the job injury. Uh, you shouldn't have to worry about zeroing out your sick leave or where or where you're going to be paying for that from. So, but I've been assured by not only the head of the union but Chief Moya is like we'll we will pay to make sure people get the help that they need. Um, because if, if we don't act in an appropriate manner and we lose someone, that's just unacceptable. And I think in anyone's eyes, um, that's, that's dealing with this right now. Thank you, uh, captains. Any, uh, other comments, concerns, Chief Boyle? Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'll add one thing. Um, I'm trying to also not only in the next year, we're going to contract for physicals again for another four years. Um, I'm trying to get uh, with this new physical, an, a mental evaluation. So not only do people that like Captain Wagner and Captain Rochus know there's a problem where other people are trying to hide it. And so they won't have to speak to us, but they'll speak to the physician or the doctor that does our annual physicals and then they can evaluate that. So we're trying to expand our resources to our physicals every year so if, even if you feel like you have no problems at all um, it's an added cost and that's not a big deal to our annual physicals to make sure that people know hey I didn't know I had a problem and now I can have a conversation with a psychologist or somebody that can help you move along so we're trying to add things to our physicals in the going years to not only deal with the the body but the mind too because um, we don't really touch that in our current physical so that is something we're adding on to our this year's contract and physicals is a, a mental evaluation on everybody in the fire department. Sounds good. Uh, Bruce, did you have uh, something to say? I know um, initially it sounded like we'd cut you off. Just want to make sure. Yeah, Val, Val yelled at me for having my body. <laughs> um, so the chief knows I work for a railroad and, and um, we had suicides uh, by train and they were very horrific. Um, the railroad required the engineer and if there was a fireman on the head end 
that viewed the incident to uh, to see a psychologist um, and before they came back to work. Um, they'd be difficult with the fire department because a lot of your calls are, you know, horrific, but, uh, you know, the very critical ones where, you know, you got, you know, fatalities and stuff, would that ever be considered where, you know, you mentioned uh, some of the guys try to hide it or ladies try to hide it and uh, that's not good either. So if it's, I'm just, I'm just putting that out. If it's mandatory, you might catch those people that um, are hesitant to, uh, to see a psychologist. That's all I had, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, anybody else, any questions? Valeria, do you see anybody? I don't yeah. going on thank, screen. Thank you, Bruce. And um, we've got Annie with her hand up for a question. Yeah, I just have a quick question. First of all, thank you captains and chiefs for this. I think it's, it's really eye opening for us and really hopefully will be helpful in how we make our report. One thing I wanted to ask you all from your perspective, how much do you think the sleep disturbances, always running on hyperarousal and not getting a good night's sleep and having sleep disturbances contribute to the, the PTSD? I could speak to this a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, uh, I could speak to this a little bit, Mrs. Raskin. Uh, um, of course, this is this is just one of the factors that's that's a revolving door. That that is something that adds to it, of course, because if you look any at any of the research and what sleep de deprivation does, I know Chief Johnson was in my presentation for training captains based around sleep. Um, it does have something to do with it. And then that 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 adds to the staffing issue. And, and it's just, there's a lot of different factors that go into this, but of course it is something, um, it is something that contributes. Um, but like I, like I said in the, in the, my previous part of the presentation is that sleep deprivation is, is happening nationwide. Uh, no matter what the shift schedule is, even in people that have, you know, four, four shifts versus our three shifts, they're working 20, 24 on 48 off. There's still those, those, there's still challenges around this. Um, but I think our department does a very good job as far as like, Hey, um, you know, we need, we need, especially as a company officer, you say, Hey, when you have a chance today, go take a nap, those kind of things. It's not like we're, we're trying to beat our guys into the ground. We're, we're preaching recovery on your days off. Don't be going out and working out harder and, you know, make sure you're recovered before you get back. Any, uh, anything else? No, it looks like Annie's complete. And now we have Gino. Go ahead, Gino. I just had a, a, a brief follow-up um, re relating to access to services. Um, you know, once someone is PERA eligible, you you're all you also have access to um, retiree health care and the benefits through the retiree retiree health care authority. Is the package of benefits that are offered to retirees, uh, because they do cover firefighters statewide, not just in Santa Fe, but statewide, is that package deficient? Is this something we should be um, addressing as a, as a city, but also communicating to retiree health care that we've got higher expectations uh, especially as it relates to uh, the first responder retirement programs. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Mr. Mora, I, I'll be completely honest. Uh, none of us are retired, so we, I don't think we know, but I will definitely research that. I think the only one that could probably help, help us with that is Councillor Rivera. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if we would know anything about the retirement 
healthcare plan. Okay. Uh, because it, it, if I remember, recall correctly, I'm you know I'm I'm ten years almost out of the this the city's plan. They had EAP services, so if I'm a current uh, employee assistance program services that if I'm a current employee, you know, I get counseling, access to counseling. Um, but, uh, you know, those, those services aren't portable beyond the, the, the city. So um, I think that that is an important question, I think, for, for your team amongst your, your retirees that, that you're close with to see what are the offerings of the retiree health care authority one to see if they're there and i there's no guarantee it is and if they're not there what can the city do um, as a member of retiree health care authority to make sure that we bring those services into our first for our first responders in retirement okay yeah mr Zamora. so i think there are services available um regarding cancer services. Mm -hmm. um, there's the presumptive, uh, presumptive, I can't remember the exact wording that says that if, uh, yeah, if a firefighter uh, develops cancer uh, after retirement, that uh, it could be uh, linked to uh, uh, your, your job duties, but I'm not sure there's anything for mental health. Okay. Because, uh, you know, if, if, if we have an ability to make recommendations in this realm, I, you know, I'd, I'd want to know if we, part of those recommendations are also that the city as a whole needs to be an advocate at the next level too. Not just being advocates within the city, but beyond. Thank you. Anyone else, Valeria, that you can see? Um, Renee, Councilwoman Villarreal, go ahead. Thanks, Valeria. I just wanted to give a shout out to Sarah Grant, who loves to attend our meetings. And um, she had sent me a resource. And I'd known about this book, but um, I realized that the chapter you sent is re very relevant. And I sent it to you, Chief Moya. Um, it, I copied you on that email. It's it may not sound relevant, but the book is called My Grandmother's Hands, but there is a chapter specifically that's about, you know, policing and it's relevant to um, fire um, departments as well. And just about things that are um, dealing with trauma. And then they give, you know, some kind of, they give some suggestions about ways that kind of alternative health um, and well-being methods that you know, if there's ways to implement them or um, within a department. So I'll just leave it at that. If you could look at that, Chief, and if, if there's anything relevant, that would be great. Um, I don't know if anyone has read that book. I don't, I don't see anyone, no. So, and Sarah, I don't know if you want to just say something about that because you have your hand up. And you're, if you could unmute, thank you. I've unmuted. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for being here tonight and talking about how you're trying to change the culture. And that is really fundamental and it also doesn't happen as quickly as I wish that it did. And I do think that, I mean, most people will agree, we got a mental health crisis across the country. So it's not just the people in your department who are super stressed, it's the people that they're trying to help out a lot. And, and one of the things that can be really good as, as both the captains probably have already learned is the more you learn how to deal with your own trauma, the more helpful you can be with dealing with other people's trauma. But um, I, I would just think that if you're part of a department and somebody kills themselves because they're so traumatized, that that would be super traumatic. And so whatever it's gonna take to keep people who are on that edge, off that edge, I would say is worth every penny. And I don't know how we fund that, but it seems pretty critical. Thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you, Sarah. Uh, anybody else? Well, lady, I, again, um, I everybody. Yeah. Happy to be your eyes. Um, no, it seems like folks are feeling complete. All right. Uh, I'm gonna take a minute to try to get through this. Uh, excuse me. Uh, this is real. Uh, thanks to uh, Captain Brocious and Captain Wagner. I've been able to start looking for help myself. It's rough. I can't drive by the street. Can't drive in certain areas where I don't think about a call, think about something horrible that went on. And you think about military guys, they probably see things, you know, a couple times during the deployment. We see those things on a monthly basis and it's hard. Thank you, Chris. We love you. Thank you. If there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. No, thanks to, again, Captain Wagner, Captain Brocious, I've been able to at least start getting help for myself and letting my family see the, the Tacoma uh, video, I think, has helped out a lot for them. Um, it's difficult, but it's necessary. And I think that I asked for this to come up to be presented at our committee because I think police and fire reach that breaking point. And if you're not in a good frame of mind, you're going to take it out on the patient or you're going to take it out on um, whoever it is that you're dealing with. And, uh, you know, we have to get help for all our public safety people. So I hope uh, hope this hits everyone. And uh, again, just uh, appreciate you uh, listening and, and um, dealing with them. Uh, it's kind of uh, sad, but um, a lot of the retirees that I've spoken to are also getting help. They've reached uh, the point where they're getting um, help uh, from various people and um, it's affecting all of us and it continues to affect us long after we retire. So thank you. Renee, if you can take over, I'd appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Chris. There's, I wish that we didn't have to talk about this on Zoom either, <laughs> but- um, Much love, Chris. Yeah. I think everyone feels that way and just seeing the faces on the zoom but we just really appreciate that what you've done and then also just to carry that for so long is is hard and so i'm sending blessings to you and your family and to all of your families <laughs> so just i think um if there's any other questions or comments or we can send out our love to our the fire team that came to join us today and we'll move on on the agenda um, commission let's see captain wagner has your hand up madam chair mr chair members of the committee i i just wanted to add that i think one thing that has contributed to the culture as it was before is that at least personally a lot of people that i know have always kind of reserved the term ptsd for combat veterans and i think that just kind of lately it's coming to the surface how much uh, police and and fire and other first responders are actually suffering from this as well and i think that that's that thinking is one reason that we got to this point. Um, it was, 
I never wanted to hear that I had PTSD when I was diagnosed because I reserved that for our heroes overseas fighting uh, in wars and seeing awful things. Um, but after all that I've learned and all that I've been through, I was able to realize that we're, you know, combat veterans will go overseas and, you know, some of them will, will see their buddies blown up or, you know, awful things like that. Um, but we are seeing awful things on a daily basis and we're not always ready for it. It's, you never know when that call is going to come. You could be eating dinner or training and a call comes out and you got to go and you might be picking up body parts off of the street, or you might be telling a mother that her son is not coming back or there's a, there's a lot of a lot of things, and so I, I that's one more thing I, I'd like others to understand is that um, trauma is everywhere, and like some of you have said, it's it's everywhere in the community. Um, we are seeing it at, at a higher level, and I I think that um, um, the other night, uh, Council Member Villarreal you mentioned uh, empathy and how that plays into it. I think that the fire department attracts empathetic people. I think that um, empathetic people want to help and want to do something. I think that they are also in a more vulnerable place to absorb that pain and absorb mm -hmm. that trauma. Um, it, it was always hard for me to, to be in somebody's worst nightmare and be involved in that and not not take it with me. And so that's just one more point that I would like you guys to understand. And um, um, Chief Rivera, um, we have your back. I'm really sorry to see what you're going through. Um, and if there's anything we can do for you, we got your back. Love you, Chief. Thank you, Captain. Um, I think Steen did. Deputy Chief Johnson, did you want to add? Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, just wanted to really uh, extend my thank you, my gratitude for uh, all of your <clears throat> attentiveness this evening and, um, and and listening and your empathy. It means a lot to uh, myself and to our department as a whole. We've got a lot of good folks in the department that uh, work hard and um, do their best and, and are viewed as heroes, but, um, you know, everybody needs help. Everybody needs to uh, help each other along the way. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Um, I think, Mary Louise, is your hand up? Yes. Um I just want to recognize, I know that um, I said, I see you and you are, each and every one of you are so important to us and thank you for your work. But I also want to say this out loud is that when you have trauma, it it's sometimes passed on to your family and oftentimes it is. And so I, I want um, you to know that we see you and we also recognize that. And so take a moment to just let your family know that there were people on this Zoom call tonight that saw you and that celebrated and appreciated each and every one of you. And that we're gonna send some extra love out there for them as well. Um, and just to know that, that we appreciate your hard work and your dedication to our community in such a huge way. And Chris, I just wanna give you a shout out um, because um, we are on this journey with you, and our heart hurts for you and with you as well. And I, and I, I just, I feel like these are moments, whether it's on Zoom or not, that we need to take account into account that we are in this together. So we will, we promise, we promise to be a voice for you guys, because we see you and we care and we appreciate you. So that's it. Thank you very much.
Um, I'm just holding out to see if there's any other questions or comments before we let the fire team go to their families <laughs> or go back to work. I don't know if anyone's at work right now, but um, Captain Brocious. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to add on to that, you know, because Chief Rivera, it's it's hard to hear one of our own that's like that. Like he was the chief when I came in, I still hold a special place in my heart. Um, but it's it's good to see him admit and and say like, hey, I needed help because there's a there was a captain when I first came in. Um, I witnessed him retire, and he was a vibrant individual. And over the next 10 years, I saw him drink himself to death and ran the code when he died. Um, and those are the kinds of things that can happen when you suffer in silence. And I don't ever want anyone to do that anymore. Um, and then, you, you know, you guys are bringing up our families. And that's something we haven't talked about is not only the mental stress on us and maybe these 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 dark places that we go to in our own minds, but the effect that it has on our families and things like divorce rates and things like that in the first responder in this first responder world. And that's not only having an impact on us, it's having the impact on the future generation because uh, the children and the, and, the, and the spouses are, are witnessing this broken or witnessing and, and, and experiencing these broken homes. And so it's, it's something that's commu felt community, community wide. It's not just, the people in this department and the people that we respond to it's everyone uh, and i just wanted to think because it's it is a global issue that just you know it's just, it just like anyone in our in our society like they said this mental health is an is an issue that's going on right now nationwide but it's something that i wanted to speak to is you know because i i almost left my wife and i almost left my wife and my six six month old son at the time um, and that was really hard to look back on that. And as Captain Wagner said, it's hard to talk about that. At times, I still feel like a coward, but this is something that I feel like I made it through to help other people to not go through that. Um, I think we need to appreciate, I think we need to really preach um, downtime um, and family time and, and, and making sure people get the help. So that way we have healthy families that are going to grow a healthy community. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Renee, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's commented on the chat. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Mary Louise. Thank you, David and Michael. Uh, you know, I love you guys. And uh, we'll continue to be an advocate for you guys and appreciate you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, guys. Um, Hope you have a good evening. If there's no other questions, um, we will continue on our agenda if everyone's okay. <laughs> Moving on to something else after, you know, kind of a heavy, heavy topic. So blessings to all of you. Thank, Thank you, you again for your time. Good night. Good night. Gina, is that your hand up? Oh, is that a wave? <laughs> um, anyone need a break? Thank you. I'm like, does anyone need a bio break? <laughs> um, or anything to, or do you want to move on? Feeling okay? I'm actually um, recovering from COVID, so I probably will not be staying on much longer. But I, we would want to continue on on a couple of our other. Let me go to our agenda just so we can cover some things tonight. Um, and Renee, I just wanna add one thing. When we talk about something this hard mm -hmm. and it brings up PTSD for various individuals, I mean, Chris, obviously with all the years you've dedicated, um, this has hit you hard and all at once. And I think thinking about how, when we leave this call, do we have someone to talk to? How are we gonna decompress? Cause it is a, especially vulnerable time and maybe we can turn off the recording and kind of decompress with each other a little bit but I think just being kind of conscientious how we end this and knowing that we're all likely impacted we don't know how each of us 
the depth of that impact. Thanks for your expertise, Annie, since you do this work regularly. Um, so we can we can definitely do that after. Um, do people want to continue on our agenda? And then we'll stop the recording and then people can decide if they want to go into the breakouts. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, Chris, did you want to say something? Your, your box lit up. Um, I think, Valeria, do you have the agenda in front of you? Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, I do. And um, we have the updates from the co-chairs, staff, facilitator, and the task force and working groups. Thank you. Um, I think the one thing just, as you all probably like didn't want to deal with, <laughs> it was so hard. Me and Valeria and Chris and Julie just like getting this stuff done during the holidays, but um, we're gonna have our fourth, qu our fourth quarter um, update for the council tomorrow night. Um, and the, if you looked at the documents, I don't know if everyone was able to look at them. I think what it, it does, it's very brief, um, the presentation, and that's good because we have another packed agenda for tomorrow night. Um, but I think essentially it's just, you know, covering some of the things that the less, the, um, learning sessions and also, some of the things moving forward with the community um, engagement and outreach and what's happening so we can update folks on that. Um, so I guess the we what the other document that complements is the actual report. So if people want to dive into the details of findings from that, that's fine. It was pretty detailed. I don't know if you all looked at that, but it had a lot of um, points that were taken from our presentations and learning sessions. So um, is there anything else that Val or um, Julie you wanted to share or Chris about the presentation tomorrow? Um, I guess the other question is wanting to know if any of you are planning on being there either in um, person or on Zoom. I'll be on Zoom, um, but just so we can look out for you and recognize you if you're coming. Yeah, I think Mary uh, Lewis and Bruce confirmed. Sorry, go ahead, Gino. No, I I was just clowning around. I'm not going to be there in person. <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson from last time. <laughs> oh yeah, that was hard. It shouldn't go that way. I'm hoping, but we do have other presentations, not just ours. Um, I think we're third on the agenda. Um, so allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> third presentation, I should say. So. Um, let's hope that things go well. We have a lot in the evening session, so it would be behoove us to be brief at the afternoon session for the council because we have a lot to cover in the in the evening. Um, was there anything else about? Did anyone have any questions about the presentation or the documents? No. Um. Can, can we leave Bruce, after the CHS make a suggestion? Go, go ahead, Bruce, first, and then Marcella. I, I apologize. For some reason, I can't raise my hand either. And you can't see me raising my hand because I can't get my camera to work. So I apologize for busting yeah. in. Um, the meeting, once once the CHS presentation's over, would we need to stay at all for any follow-up or anything? OK, that's all. Well, well, I'm sure there'll be questions. Right after what, that. What to expect. <laughs> Never know what to yeah. expect. <laughs> but yeah, if you, we can send you the Zoom link for the meeting if you all, but if, but let us know because um, I think you said Mary Louise and Bruce are going to be on Zoom. Did you all say that? Okay. So if there's uh, anyone else, we can send may, that to you. May I ask, may ask what day is that on again? That's tomorrow night. At tomorrow night. The meeting starts at five, but we have other items. Um, the presentations are at the beginning. So. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll log on from where I teach, but once my class has to start, I'll have to get off. No problem. And, 
Yeah, so it starts at six. So I'll be on for almost an hour. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you. Thanks. Anything else on the presentation? Um, I think that's it. Anything else you want to share, Chris? Uh, Julie and I had a meeting with uh, Dr. Sanchez today, and um, I don't know if she wants to share some of that discussion. Sure, I can give um, I can give a, a brief update. Um, so uh, as of this survey, there's 14 more that need to be completed before they hit their 300 or before Dr. Sanchez hits his 300 mark. Um, the focus groups are going to be based on the information gathered from the preliminary survey. Um, and um, Dr. Sanchez requests, and Marcela, I remember you had mentioned this at one point, but uh, getting the priority group list together for the focus groups. Um, so I don't know if there's already a shared uh, list that's been going on, but he's, um, you know, Counselor Rivera and myself, you know, kind of talked with him about, because right now the focus groups, I think there's only supposed to be six focus groups and then 20 individual interviews. And we were thinking it would be much more powerful to expand the amount of focus groups done versus, you know, having the 20 individual um, interviews. And so he's more than open to, you know, if we do have a large priority group list, um, you know, he's more than willing to, you know, be flexible on that instead of just doing six. Um, focus groups. Um, the other request that he made was, um, I'll work with him to connect him to different groups in the area based on the priorities for the focus group sessions. And um, yeah, those uh, in-person focus groups and uh, virtual focus groups should start early February through March. And um, yeah, did I miss anything, Counselor? Uh, and he's anticipating getting the final report to us by May. Yeah, that's all I was going to add. <laughs> Thank you. Marcella, question. Thanks. I was going to do this in our, in our working group, um, but this is a good time. So, we do not have a cap of 300. That's just the minimum as per the contract with the city. So we have an open link right now and we can discuss this in our working group, but, um, or you can just email me if you want and, and working group members, if you want the open link. What our working group wants is hard to reach folks through organizations that we know for vulnerable communities who might not have been randomly one of the 300 people called for the survey. So even though he's got close to 300, that's the minimum. I, you know, Somos can do 20, you know, I talked to Chainbreaker, they can do some. It would be great if, um, if Mary Louise, this is for surveys, not focus groups. If Mary Louise, you could get 10 to 15 young people to participate uh, and, and whoever else. So we have a running list in our Google Doc for organizations that can do the open link to, um, to the survey so that the survey re also reflects hard to reach folks. So that's one. And we need to do that within the next couple of weeks or uh, at least before mid-February when they start doing the focus groups. So that's one. Uh, and two, we're the reason why Julie and Councilor Rivera, we had interviews and why we think interviews are still important is because there will be people that we want to participate in this process who will not participate in a focus group and feel like they can do it. 
And so we're following a model that was established by the MDS task force, um, the Municipal Drug Strategy Task Force, of coupling focus groups with individual interviews with people who may be currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, people who, you know, who just still don't feel comfortable within a focus group setting sharing. So we do want to keep those um, the interviews in, in addition to the focus groups. He can keep until, you know, like maybe the third week of January, the live link open. So we just need to identify which organizations for the, the survey. And, um, and then we'll also, in our working group, um, establish the list of folks that we also want to reach out to to participate in the focus groups for mid-February. Am I missing anything, working group? <laughs> no, so Dr. Sanchez did recommend that, um, uh, I guess in his experience, that you know you can do 20 individual interviews or do 20 focus groups and get an additional 140 people in that when you look at a when you look at a presentation that comes out with 140 more responses and just 20 that makes more of an impact than just 20 individual uh responses so that's what we talked about um you know, clearly he's going to do whatever we want him to do, but um, yeah, that, we can have that a conversation that. about that. Yeah. 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 Um, and he, he also said that he could also leave the open, the open survey, you know, per their contract, they want to catch 20 or 200 respondents, but he can actually leave it open until the end of their contract. He has no problem with doing that and capturing more um individuals so in the survey right in the survey that's right so i do want to mention and this was uh in response councillor Villarreal, to tomorrow so the the survey is not um it's not our intention from the working group anyway to do an open link to the world and so that should not be a part i mean that's not what our intention is um we have a, a good number of surveys now that were randomly taken from New Mexico residents. And now for the rest of the surveys, we're really focusing on really hard to reach, reach people in certain categories of vulnerable communities in our city. So I just Correction. wanted to it's share that. It's not New Mexico, it's random Santa Feans. Sorry, I'm sorry, Santa Fe. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> we do so much with Gabe at the state level. That, um, and so I just wanna, because people from the council Asked questions about that <laughs> last time, and we don't want them to think that this is a big open survey for everyone. Um, so I just wanted to flag that for tomorrow's presentation since I'm not going to be there. And we will have to identify those 20 interviews or so um, for those hard, really hard to reach individuals who will not participate in a focus group who would not volunteer to focus, but who who we think's deeper in lived experiences are valuable to the to, to our findings and report. Thanks, Marcela. Emily, did you want to add to that? Just I have actually a question about the timeline. Um, I think Julie, you mentioned that Dr. Sanchez's report will be in May. Is that right? And just worried a little bit that if our recommendations are due, <clears throat> excuse me, shortly thereafter, that doesn't give us enough time, in my opinion, to like really digest what we're hearing from community um, to be able to work on our recommendations. So I'm just curious how we see that timeline working and whether we can, I mean, a final, great, the final report, but is there a way to see some of the findings earlier than that um, so that we can start um, merging that with you know some of the learning uh, that we've been doing over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think the draft report is actually going to be due in April. Um, but the final like full, you know, bells and whistles and everything would be 
completed in May. So yeah, there is going to be an opportunity for everybody to see the report a lot earlier. And then we should be getting the preliminary results from that first round of survey surveying um, in February. Marcella? Gabe is also, Emily, willing to come to this task force meeting and do a the first report which, and, and explain to us what the survey found, right? And so he could probably even do that in late January. He could do, probably do it at our next meeting based on, he's so flexible about it, but for me, the most important thing would be to make sure that we get our open link to the organizations that we want, you know, to get in so that he can incorporate that as opposed to waiting until the end. It's great that he can keep the link open until the end, but it won't make his preliminary report and based on the focus on the surveys. And that I think we could use one to help him decide what to delve into in the focus groups, but also to keep us sort of on the straight and narrow. <laughs> with um, with community engagement. I think um, tomorrow night there will be probably questions like, how are those people picked that were interviewed by the phone and that was randomly selected Santa Fans um, that, and then the open survey is not open to anyone that wants to do it, but it was more um, intentionally targeted to stakeholder groups, I guess. Is that the best way to describe it? Yeah, I would I would also just say, you know, that, that we had a contract with him to do 300 surveys yeah. that were random of residents and we're almost complete. Those are almost complete. I mean, I think that's, that's where we're really giving, getting the broad sense from the community. And then we're gonna go deeper into the <laughs> more vulnerable groups who may not otherwise participate in a random phone survey. And if there's a question just about how we pick those stakeholder groups for the next focus groups, that's based on Dr. Sanchez's expertise and our community group expertise. Anything else? We're missing there? Yeah, it's based on the working groups. And I think that we identified stakeholders. It might actually be in the contract. I would have to look at the language. I was just looking at it the other day. Um, for vulnerable groups that generally don't have a, yeah, just vulnerable, hard to reach minority populations. That's pretty much it. Youth, formerly incarcerated, incarcerated <laughs> folks who, you know, that's really wh where we're going with the stakeholder groups. Uh, Dr. Sanchez did talk about uh, focus groups being uh, around seven people. He said once you get uh, above that, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So just keep that in mind as well. Thanks, Chris. Um, do you have more to add, Marcela? I'm sorry. I was gonna. We were gonna talk about this in our folk in our working group meeting, but it makes sense to do it here since we're talking about this. Um, I am concerned that there isn't going to be enough time for him to complete the third piece of this, which were the video journals that he was going to do with young people. Um, and it's in part because of a prolonged IRB process. I think he can move forward with it, but probably not by April first. So. Um, I think he's looking for other youth convenings to try to capture that voice. So if anybody, I, I also think that Mary Louise, you're like key and crucial to this um, and other youth organizations that might be interested in helping provide, if not additional sets of focus groups with young people, some way of connecting with this community engagement process. I'm nervous we're not gonna get youth voice in this. So we really have to think that through. So Marcella, um, my colleague here is taking over doing a youth summit for the city in partnership with United Way. And that's gonna be happening here in early spring, um, early spring, you know, February, March, two months. Um, 
And so we're going to coordinate with that group to see if he can pull some of the students to do the photo journaling piece. So we're working on that in coordination with him. Um, can I just say something about that? I, I really believe that it's really important not just to pull in students, but students that have experienced um, the juvenile justice system, uh, teen court programs, because oftentimes in these youth summits, uh, the people that are invited are uh, kids that are doing really well. That's and actually, sorry, Mary Louise, that is not the case. Okay. I just have, you know, I'm sorry, I just have to put a plug in there because I did the 2015 and 2017 one and we were incredibly intentional about inviting youth who are in alternative programs, youth who are not currently in school, youth who are in GED programs, and they were very well represented. And also bringing in youth who are, you know, from the School for the Deaf. We had youth from the Santa Fe Indian School represented. So, oh, good. Okay. You know, okay. I just, I don't want to, <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I appreciate that, uh, but I, I think Marcella and, and I have experienced working with some of the kids that usually don't have a voice. So I love that you said that. Um, and, I, and I'm sorry if it felt judgy because th that's not where I'm coming from. Um, and I, I would love to, to help if you need, um, uh, I, I know that Youth Work sends a bunch of kids, which is great, um, but there's other, um, uh, I think that Teen Court would be a good uh, tap in, um, as well as, um, you know, that you work with Andrea. So that would be a, a, also a good um, source of, two things can happen is the kids that are in the system can get, can get community service and at the same time um, be uh, a, an advocate for what we're trying to get. Good suggestions, as long as they're like safe spaces to be able to talk with youth and, and have them feel comfortable to talk about their experiences. I'm sure you talked about that with Gabe, um, Julie, just like at the summit, how that would work. So that sounds good. I, I like the alternative to that, Marcella, what you talked about. Um, so if you all can work at that with your working group to with um, Dr. Sanchez. That would be great. Um, Emily? Oh, wait, I thought Emily had <laughs> hands. Sorry. Um, should we move on? Is there anything else that people had questions about for the community engagement? Mm, All righty. Bruce, I saw you unmute. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else from staff, from Julie, from Valeria? Just, Chris? yeah, just one little thing tomorrow when I uh, share the, the meeting minutes, um, I'm also going to share your work plan for 2023, where I've started to capture potential recommendations and follow up action items from this last year. So you'll see some of that plugged in. And of course, you can also start to include uh, um, proposed recommendations from your own, you know, your working groups. Um, the meeting calendar is also up for 2023, which will also help us coordinate our learning sessions and, and presentations. So um, yes, we'll be sharing all of that with all of you. Manana. Monica, when you say ahead. manana, what do you mean? Tomorrow morning. I usually send a oh. follow up with the meeting got minutes. It, and it, it. Items and I thought you meant at the council meeting. I was tomorrow. Like, really? oh, no, 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 cool. not mañana as in tomorrow. <laughs> and Valeria, are you, are you okay with doing the presentation tomorrow? I'm happy to do whatever <laughs> you all need me to do. <laughs> okay. Then we'll do it the same format and okay. then see how, like, see if it goes differently tomorrow. <laughs> like, you and Chris will do the opening and then I'll go into the slide deck. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Monica, do you have a question? Comment? Yeah, I just had a, a couple things I wanted to share just at the end. Um, and, and one, I just want to reiterate the importance 
of having the individual interviews. I spoke to um, our advisory board um, who are all um, people that work in the system, but were also involved in the criminal legal system um, when, when they were younger. And they all said specifically because it would be a focus group of just um, of people that live and work here, that a, a focus group of seven, it, there could be people there that you grew up with. You may not feel comfortable sharing some of your experiences in front of them. Now, if this was a statewide survey, it would be much different, but because we're a small community, there, you know, you never know who's gonna be there. I mean, my family teases me, right? I could walk down the street going to a meeting and I could run into four people separately that I know. And for those of us that are born and raised, that's something that can come up. So it's difficult to then talk openly sometimes about your experiences with law enforcement in the system or with the fire department around people that maybe you don't feel comfortable with. So I just wanna reiterate that there's an importance for both the, the having having the you know the the seven person group, but also having an opportunity for individual sessions. That's the first thing, and the second thing I really appreciate the conversation around youth, um, because my experience is much like Mary Louise's in the sense that oftentimes I know that I was act, asked to participate in teen court and other things whenever I asked to to mentor. Um, children that, you know, that are from the community, they always wanted to put me with kids that were already doing really well. You know, they were, it wasn't with the children that were actually struggling. So, you know, and, but I love that there's other people like what you shared, Julie, that, you know, being intentional, inviting the kids that actually are struggling. So I just want to honor what you both brought to the table and say that I, I, I've had the same experience. Um, and I hope that we can be extremely intentional when we start to identify youth that have been involved in the system um because that's really hard and it's really scary um especially because there might be other stuff going on with that with parents and cyfd involvement and other things right it's actually even more sensitive um that particular group for all of the um legal implications of them participating in in a group so i just wanted to share that Good points. Thank you. Um, anything else people want to share? Updates? It seems like we're getting at time, so I don't know if people are wanting to get into working groups. I think we covered a lot just now, and I think with our working group, we'll just have to figure out, kind of synthesize some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, I think there's, and that's what Valeria was talking about. We've been, when we work on the document, we give just the summary, but there's some things that we've talked about as potential like recommendations that she's moving to another document that she's just as a placeholder. So um, I think we'll just have to figure that out with our working group the next time if we wanna meet and just figure out how, um, if there's any further questions we have for staff, um, or if we're ready to come up with some of the things that we've been working on based on our research and listening and learning sessions. So um, anything else? I just wanted to uh, ask Julie to share with Dr. Sanchez the importance of individual uh, interviews as discussed here in the task force. So I know we had had a little bit different conversation. So if you can let them know the importance of, of that and what the committee thought, I think that's important. Yeah, that's good. All right. We're, we're good to just come off the recording then, just to make sure that we're 